welcome saints to this July 23rd edition of NTT's Kingdom of God with the Eyes of Equity, and welcome to How to Live a Kingdom Life, and welcome to the Back to Eden Project, and welcome to Repent for the Kingdom of God and its Enforcement is Near. I'm your host, Christian Walters. We left off last week on Romans chapter 16, so there's where we're picking up at, Romans chapter 16, and we've basically gone through all of Romans according to a basic outline, and to recap that outline, Romans basically breaks down into a uh, two sections. The first section, chapters 1 through 11, is the doctrine, or what needs to be known, and the second half is chapters 12 through 16, which is the practical application of putting the doctrine into practice. So it's the practical application. You have the doctrine, 1 through 11, and the practical application of it, chapter 12 through 16. It's basically how Romans breaks down. Now, to break it down even further, those two sections, it breaks down the first sections, 1 through 11, breaks down chapter 1 and 2, basically, is the depravity of man. You've got a problem. God says you've got a problem. That's chapters 1 and 2. That sets up the next chapter, chapters 3 and 4, for the solution. And the solution is justification. And chapter 3 and 4 talks about justification, which is the first dimension of salvation. It is the past tense dimension. So chapter 3 and 4 gives you the solution, and now what happens, the results? The result is chapter 5, peace with God. Justification results in chapter 5, peace with God. Then comes chapter 6 and 7, which is the second dimension of salvation. After you're being justified in 3 and 4, now there's something you must do because it rests on you doing something, that you're sanctifying yourself. So it's sanctification, that's chapter 6 and 7, which is the second dimension of salvation, where your works count. In justification, your works don't count. You can't present your works. It's Christ's work and his work alone. Chapter 3 and 4 is your works applied in sanctifying yourself. That's chapter 6 and 7, sanctification. Chapter 8 is glorification, the last dimension, the last tense, past its uh, future tense. Because there's three tenses in salvation, past, present, and future tense. Past tense, chapter 3 and 4, justification. Present tense, sanctification, chapters 5 and 6, or 6 and 7, excuse me. Future tense, glorification, is chapter 8. So now you've got the bulk of the whole thing, really, in chapters 1 through 8. The foundation, that's why... Romans is the foundational book. And you could spend years, a lifetime, studying just Romans alone. The quick study that we've done here in the last three, four, five weeks, six weeks, is, it doesn't really, we're just scratching the, barely, barely scratching the surface. You could study Romans easily for three years, start getting the goodies out of it. So that's chapter 8 is the last one. Now, then it's chapter 9, 10, and 11, which is the election of the Jews and the Gentiles. It's by faith alone that the Jews and the Gentiles are elected into God's kingdom. They're chosen, and they're given faith. That's Ephesians 2.8. The gift that you are given is faith, which results into your justification, which results into your sanctification, which results into your glorification. The three tenses of dimensions of salvation. But it's in the understanding of works, because it's what God accepts as being works that you can present, and what he doesn't accept as works, which you can't present. And it comes down to a faith issue. And the whole Bible is all about a faith issue. What is the object of your faith? Is your object of your faith Christ's work and justification? Or is the object of your faith Christ plus something else? And that leads to a doctrine of demons. So really, it's a doctrine of demons of faith plus works and the commingling of the dimensions of salvation. The three dimensions of salvation. Because you're taking this sanctification dimension, which has to do with your works, and you're commingling it in with the justification dimension, which is Christ's work and his work alone. And the way God has designed the plan of salvation, you can't do that. You've got to keep each compartment separate, segregated. You can't commingle them. And it really comes down to an issue of understanding or discernment what works are. And that's very easy, because I've come up with a very simple definition of what works are. Works is anything that you do in the body, your body, that you present to God for justification, the first dimension of salvation. God accepts nothing that you present to him. Nothing. And what would the something that you would be presenting to him be? That would be this doctrine of demons. Well, it's faith plus you in some way. And what would some of the you examples be? Well, coming to an altar call. Uh, you got to get a relationship with Christ. you got to change your life. 
you got to make Christ the Lord and Savior of your life. These are all doctrines of demons. You can't make Christ your Lord. He's your Savior. If you present lordship salvation to him, you're going to turn up into a Roman, uh, Matthew 7.21 scenario. 7.21 and 22. Where he's going to say to you, you know, I don't recognize you, you lawless one. Because making him lord of your life is doing everything that he commands. And that's only can be done by Christians who are already justified. Now, if we're talking about justification first, there's no lord that comes in. Because you'd be presenting your works to him for justification, which he's going to reject. You must make him savior of your life first. And you must accept the salvation that he is giving you due to justification by the gift of faith. That gift comes by him and him alone. So you can't even boast that you mustered the faith up. That faith had to be a gift. When it's a gift, now you can't boast. And only God can boast, because he's the one that gave it to you. Or else you wouldn't be able to see him or recognize him. So now it's not your work. It's his work. He gives you the faith. It's his work. He sends his son, and he dies on a cross. It's his work. And they're all one and the same, the Holy Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So that takes care of the commingling of some of the examples of being... Uh, doing works in your body in presentation of taking the sanctifying works that you would do, in other words, cleaning up your life, going and having the uh, symbol of water baptism. I mean, if you stop think about it, water baptism, okay, isn't that something that you would do? Isn't that your work? Well, or how much water is enough? Is it total immersion or is it just sprinkling? You see, you really don't know because... It might not be enough water, or maybe it's too much water, but it really doesn't matter because it's none of your works, because you can't present any of those things, and God has designed it so you can't, because he won't accept them. The water baptism that you would do, if you do it at all, is really not necessary. It's just an outward sign or confirmation that I've accepted Christ. Your name's already been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You don't need to go out and be water baptized, or do any other kind of ritual or tradition. See, because man always wants to work and apply his works on God's throne. can't do that. And if you really understood these things, you would see that they weren't really necessary, if you really understood them. Because you may be turning them into a ritual and a tradition and nullifying the word of God, which was Christ's foremost doctrine is presented in Matthew, which was the conflict of his ministry with those that were in power, the Sanhedrin, that they were teaching a false, doctrine of law and it was their interpretation of the law they turned the law into a tradition and a ritual that he rejected because I don't run my kingdom by ritual and tradition I run by the principles of equity my kingdom that's what I run my kingdom by he said because he demonstrated that all through his ministry the equity walk and he ignored the law the way that the Jews taught the law the way they understood it They nullified, their traditions and rituals nullified the word of God, the true meaning behind it, the substance. And he said, you let the camel slide by and you strain out the gnat. He said, you do the latter is what you should have been doing instead of the former. And you've passed the more important thing up for a false thing. And you've become blind guides, teaching the blind. And you're blind yourself. And you're both falling into a pit. You've made it twice as hard for someone to enter into the kingdom of heaven due to your traditions and your interpretations. You haven't taught the truth. You've taught lies. He told the Pharisees and Sadducees, your father is the father of lies. And they said, no, our father is the father of Abraham. We are born of God by heritage. And Christ said, it ain't about heritage. You got the sign of the outward circumcision, but your inward heart is not circumcised. See, these are the conflicts of the traditions versus the commandments of God. And what is the commandment of God? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And how do I do that? Love your brother as yourself. And in this, you fulfill all the law. But if you don't recognize Christ as the Messiah, you're stuck in a tradition of rituals that were supposed to be signposts pointing to you to who the Messiah was. 
And since you didn't recognize him to be the Messiah, the Messiah, then all your signposts were in vain. So all the things that Israel had to do were to keep them in tune with who the Messiah was, because everything that was the ritual and the tradition was pointing to Christ himself. All the weights and measures, the lengths, the types of materials that were in the tabernacle, the temple, were all symbolic of Christ in some way. The particular weight of gold represented Christ. Everything in the temple, the rituals, the materials, the dimensions, all pointed to Christ himself. They were all signposts. And God had them painting signs for centuries to be able to recognize the Messiah when he showed up. And he showed up and they couldn't recognize him. Why? Because they turned it into a ritual of works. And they were presenting the works. Even today, the Jews think that they can justify themselves by the keeping of the law. And the law that has been kept is the rituals and the tradition that they've established as being the law. And those workers of iniquity think that they can work their way to heaven. And they can't, because God won't accept man's work in any way. Because you've taken the works of sanctification that man does to sanctify himself. And you present them before God for justification. And God rejects them. So that takes us up to 1 through 8. And then 9, 10, and 11, the election of the Jews and the Gentiles. And the doctrine of demons, of faith and works, and the commingling of the three dimensions of salvation, which I've explained tonight and in the past more in depth. So if you want to go into the deeper study of the three dimensions of salvation, check out the past recordings on the subject. This is like the 12th recording, I believe, for tonight. And we left off on Romans 16. We'll be getting there in a minute, but I want to finish up that now we've covered 1 through 11, basically, and now it's the practical application of the doctrine, which is basically chapters 12 through 16. Chapter 12 through 16. Funny. Really, it's not funny, but it's very logical, the sequence of development of Romans. It follows a highly sophisticated logical sequence. Where the practical application starting at chapter 12 is that verse 1, God starts off and he says that this is the way you worship me. That's chapter uh, 12, verse 1. It says, this is your spiritual act of worship. This is how you worship me. Which points to number 2. Verse 2. First thing you got to do is you got to transform your mind. Because everything that you know today has been taught to you by the worldly pattern of thinking. Which is basically all on the pattern of the world. And that pattern of the world is money, power, and sex. Money, power, and sex. That is basically the god, the false idol, the god of the golden calf, the god of Ishtar, the god of Baal, the god of sex, the god of fornication, revelry. These false idols, this is the pattern of the world thinking, which is really Romans chapter 1 and 2, man's foolish wisdom. Thinking themselves to be wise, they became fools. The isms, the psychologies, and the uh, Darwinism, the, uh, I can't think of some of those psychology guys, uh, the isms and the psychologies. So that's chapter 12, 1 and 2, verse 1 and 2. you got to be able to discern, develop discernment, which is to be able to prove what the will of God is and that which is good and acceptable and perfect. In other words, you have to recognize that you are born in a barn, a kingdom that is training you on the powers of Satan, how to be agents for him. And you need to recognize that you need to transform your mind, your thinking, and get out of that kingdom and get into another kingdom, the kingdom of God and his principles. And you need to transform your thinking on how you are living. The God of the golden calf. That's commerce. You know, the money today is all commercial, which is Satan's kingdom and how it's used today. Because money in the Genesis, I believe it is, where it spells out the use of money. The proper use of money was if I had goods and services, in other words, cattle and vegetables and things, and I was supposed to give it to somebody to help them out in their need. And they were too far away, and by the time I got there, you know, the cattle would drop dead and the vegetables would be rotten, then, in order to give to that person, I would have to convert 
that substance into a medium of exchange, money, gold, and then send the gold because the gold won't perish. And the gold would represent the value of the substance. And then they would convert the substance of the gold back into cattle and vegetables over there. But today, I do not see a need for any money at all because today we can put things on an airplane and fly clear around the world in a couple hours. And vegetables don't perish because we have refrigeration and we have the ability to get it there without it perishing. So I see no need for any money today. Anything that's not perishable, we could put it on a ship and we could ship it anywhere in the world. So we have the power and the ability to take and cure all famine, all hunger, all diseases, and just about all of man's ills caused by the lack of justification. The church has the ability to do that. But does it know and understand the three dimensions of salvation and the definition and meaning of love to do that? No. Because they're relying on Satan's kingdom, worshiping Satan, but say they are Christians and wearing the badge of Christians on their shoulders. Participating in a world of commerce, using money, which they don't need. And money is really a sign-up for that kingdom. It's like, okay, to earn that money, you must work 40 hours a week, which is the bulk of your life in your week. So you're converting your life, your time, into a worthless piece of paper that represents Satan's kingdom, and then you are told how much that dollar is worth, which you don't control in the conversion of your time. And then you are said, okay, you only get to make, say, $10 an hour on this job. And I'm going to stress the word job. So you're an employee working a job for a amount of money that you don't control. You're told you make $10 an hour, and then you're told how much a dollar is worth, and that is controlled not by you either. And you are working your life, giving your life, your time, in conversion of something, two items that you don't control. Boy, are you duped. Rather than be a creator, an imitator of God in Ephesians 5.1, and create something of substance. So you would be in control of everything that you produce, instead of somebody else being in control of it. Now, you just transformed your mind. You just did the proper worship. So this, what we teach here is... What we teach here in the kingdom of God with the eyes of equity is put the eyes of equity on, which is Psalm 17, 2, so that you'll be able to gain the discernment of the differentiation of the two kingdoms and what you're actually doing, because they're diametrically opposed. They're opposites. One has a lack of love, and the other one is filled full of fear, because you have a fear that you don't make enough money. But here, if you didn't rely on money, you wouldn't have anything to fear, because you could create the substance that you needed. And what would you have to fear? Your lack of money. Now, you don't have that fear because you know that you can support yourself and you don't need money. Welcome to the Back to Eden Project. The Romans 12, 1 and 2, which is really the book of Nehemiah because the Jews thought that they were worshiping God correctly until they discovered the book of Nehemiah, the lost book there. And they found out that they were worshiping God wrong. Well, what was they, they were worshiping him wrong? Well, they were doing the false idol worship. They had the altars of Ishtar and Moloch and Baal there. They had the Asherah poles that they made the sacrifices on. And they had gotten completely off track. And they were worshiping God, thinking they were worshiping God. No, they were worshiping Satan. They didn't even know it. So in Nehemiah, when they discovered this lost book and they were corrected, they all repented. They all did the sackcloth and ash thing. And what did they do? They tore out the false altars. They tore down the Asherah poles. They stopped worshiping the false gods and through the idols, and they went back to God in true worship. That's what we need to do as the church today, because we are worshiping the God of Satan, the God of Golden Calf, the God of Ishtar, the God of Moloch. We think because the law says that we can do such and such, that that's righteous. No. Just because I say the sky is purple doesn't make it so. The Bereans in Acts, were commended. They were highly commendable because they listened to what Paul said, went to the scriptures and checked it out, and came back and said, Paul, you're right. We agree with you. We walk in agreement with you. What can we do now? And like the Philippians jailer in chapter 16 in Acts, he said, this is the work of God. This is the kind of work that you do. Just believe 
and what Christ did, his work, and that'll get you justified. And then you can work on sanctifying your life, changing your life and sanctifying, pulling out the ash poles in your life, getting rid of the false idols in your life, and sanctifying your life so that God's blessings could be had. So that God opens the windows of heaven and pours out the blessings of heaven on your life. Now, not when you die. You see, you're still stuck in a habit of the kingdom of Satan, and you must transform your mind from that. Romans 12, 2. And that's your spiritual act of worship. A process of self-transformation in sanctification. Romans 6 and 7. That opens the blessings of God on your life. Because the covenant, the trust that God has with man is basically this. He says, if you will do this, I will do that. So it's a this and that thing. You, in justification, because it's really an equitable process in justification and an equitable process in sanctification, but two different dimensions where your works apply in two different ways. In justification, your works don't apply. So the only thing you can do is by faith. And that equitable process that you do is accept by faith alone what Christ did, that he's your ticket into heaven, by his work, by him dying on a cross, by him paying the price, that he justifies you, all by him, so that he gets the glory, not you. Then your sanctification sense is set in stone, irrevocable. Then it goes on to the sanctified part. It's equity, process, and sanctification. The act of spiritual worship is then now start taking out the altars, false altars out of your life. Transform your mind. Learn what is good and acceptable and perfect. Discernment. Putting on the eyes of equity, in other words. He who comes into equity must be doing equity. That's the first maxim in equity, which is the same as where it was derived from, is Matthew 7.12. 7.12 in Matthew says, do unto others that you have them do it to you. Same thing. All i got to do is connect the dots. And it's the same thing as uh, Christ and Matthew was saying with the adulterous woman. Let he that is without sin cast the first stone. That's the first maxim. That's Matthew 7, 12. He who comes into equity must be doing equity. Let he is without sin cast the first stone. You must be without sin or in a process of cleaning up your life. And the more you clean up your life, the bigger the window opens and the blessings of God start pouring out in your life. So you don't need a job. You need a job. It's not a job. You need a job. Notice they're spelled the same. Job and job are spelled the same. J-O-B. Which one do you have? Choose this day which God you're going to serve. Which job, which job you're going to serve. Which J-O-B are you going to serve today? If you pick the job, you are Deuteronomy 28 cursed, and you have a mind of confusion and everything else that goes along with Deuteronomy 28. You pick the Job. Job was a righteous man, declared by God to be righteous by faith. And chapter 1 says, look at the blessings that God gave Job. All the cattle, the sheep, the property, the children. The children that he was given. It was by faith alone that Abraham was justified. It was by faith alone that Job was justified. Which God are you worshiping? Equity applied to justification. Faith alone. Grace alone. Christ alone. The scriptures alone. And when all that happens all by itself alone, then you've got all the glory going to God. You put God on the throne and taken yourself off the throne. Because one way is man-centered thinking, and the other way is God-centered thinking. So, that was pretty much the spiritual acts of worship rolling it all down. you got to get rid of your job, and you got to get a job. you got to pull out the Asher poles and the false idols out of your life. Now, if you don't, okay, that's fine. You can lead a dry spiritual life, and the windows of heaven will be closed or slightly open. You get the general... Uh, equity or the general graces of God. The sun comes up in the morning and sets in the sun. The rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous. The sun uh, shines on the righteous and the unrighteous. You know, you all got the same as the unrighteous. You may be justified. You you may be made righteous, but, you know, it's 
your walk now that counts. You may be a partaker, but you're not an overcomer. Partaker is justified. Overcomer has sanctified his life. That's the definition. Partakers are just privates in God's kingdom of army. They're the low man on the totem pole. They're just ground pounders. They're the basic Christian, which are most of them. The, the captains and the generals and the higher-ups are the ones who sanctify their walk now while they live. To earn the blessings now and the blessings eternal. If you choose to be just a ground pounder, hey, you got into heaven by the skin of your teeth, you're a partaker, great kingdom of heaven is far greater than anything, even as a partaker. But you could have been a higher position. You could have been a, a captain, a uh, general. You could have had more responsibility, more rewards, more position, more fellowship time with Christ himself. You would have been closer to the seats of 24 seats around the throne. You don't have a good position. You're way back in the back rows. And this is for eternity. So if you don't want to pull out the Asherah poles, you don't have to. But there are rewards, eternal rewards for that. So how can your 65 years of meager life on this earth compare to a life in heaven for eternity, where you have a position, a responsibility, and fellowship time that could have been greater as an overcomer than as a partaker? So it all does, it's really all up to you whether or not you want to do this Romans 12, 1 and 2. And how do you do this, Romans 12, 1 and 2? Well, you do chapter 13. Be subject to a, I don't want to add, righteous government. And if it's not righteous, you got to make it righteous. It's up to you, it's your responsibility, which is your spiritual act of worship, to make it a righteous government, if it's not righteous. And it's also up to you to know and understand equity and what is a righteous government, because you can't implement a righteous government unless you know what a righteous government is. Then there's, Chapter 14, the principles of conscience, knowing and understand that. And chapter 15, which ties in with 14, the self-denial on behalf of others, because the others that it's talking about, these based on the principles of conscience, doing what's right. So it's all about a righteous government, a righteousness of the self, and a righteousness of operating on principles, not affecting other people's consciences, so that they would not be falling into an unrighteousness. Putting on the eyes of equity. Righteousness corresponds to the same as equity. They're co-equivalent. Uprightness. What's fair? What's just? That's equity. But that's also the definition of righteous. They're both synonymous. One and the same word. Just about any time you see righteousness in the New Testament, you can put the word equity in its Old Testament definition in its place. You can swip and, uh, swap them out whenever. Because they, they mean the same thing. But now in place, in place of justification... It's talking about works that Christ did instead of versus works that you do. Now, you can't take works that you do and present them for justification. So we must be talking about sanctification then. So that's why it's important to keep the three dimensions of salvation, understand them and keep them compartmentalized and so that you do not commingle them, because you can't, because you get off on wrong doctrines, doctrines of demons. Very easy. Same thing with James 2.19 in conflict with what Paul taught. No, they're not. It's just a wrong understanding. You've harmonized it wrong. One way it doesn't harmonize, the other way it does. James was talking about faith plus works. Well, how can that be? Romans and Paul talks about faith, no works. In chapter 3 and 4, well, obviously he wasn't talking about justification in chapter 3 and 4. He was talking, James was talking about sanctification in chapter 5, uh, uh, chapter 6 and 7, excuse me. 6 and 7, James was talking about 6 and 7, sanctification. Faith and works. You already have faith, and now you're going to do the good works. You're going to sanctify your life, which is what we're talking about. James was a pastor, head of a church. Paul was an evangelist, starting churches. Paul taught justification. James taught sanctification. Faith plus sanctification. That's what James is talking about. 219, those that had faith, Christians already, pastor taking those with faith and teaching them how to walk a sanctified walk how to become more sanctified in their life so that the windows of God would be open and the blessings would be poured out on their life. So you got 15, now you got 16, which is greetings and love expressed. 16.1. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is at Sanishria, that you receive her in the Lord in the manner worthy of the saints and that you help her in whatever manner she uh, may have need of you. 
for she herself has also been a helper of many and of myself as well. In other words, a helper, patron. Verse 3, Greet Priscilla uh, and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my life risk their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also to the churches of the Gentiles. Also greet the church that is in their house. Greet Ephotitus, who beloved, who is of the first covenant to Christ from Asia. Uh, greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet Acerdonius and uh, Junius as my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are outstanding among the apostles and who also were in Christ before me. Greet Amphiatus and my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Stichius, my beloved. Greet Apelles, the approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobus. Greet Herdonian, my kinsman. Greet those of the household of Narcissus and those of the Lord. Greet Tyrophania and Typhrophos, workers in the Lord. Greet Perseus and Beloved, who worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, the choice of the man in the Lord, also his mother and mine. Greet Asinitris, Philigon and Hermes, Paterbus, Hermas, and the brethren with them. Greet Philigos and Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympias as all the saints who were with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Now are yours, you brethren. Keep your eyes on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teachings which you learned, and turn away from them. For such men are the slaves not of the Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. <coughs> but by their smooth and flattering speech, <coughs> they deceive their hearts. They deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting, for the report of the obedience has reached to all. Therefore, I am rejoicing over you. But I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent and what is evil. In other words, there's the discernment. Learn what is good and evil. That's Romans 12, verse 2, last, last sentence. That's also put on the eyes of equity, Psalm 17, 2. So I'm rejoicing over you, but I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent and what is evil. Verse 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of the Lord Jesus will be with you. Timothy, be my fellow worker, greets you and do... Lucius and Jason, and so fatter, my kinsman. I, Tritius, who write this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, host me and the whole church, greets you. Esthrus and the city treasurer greets you, and Corderus and, and brother. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ would be you with you all. Amen. Now, to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel, and the preaching of the Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for the long ages past. And what was that secret? That the gospel, the good news, was meant for the Gentiles as well as the Jews. Verse 26, But now I, but now is manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith. Obedience of faith, that's sanctification. Justified and sanctified. To the wise, uh, to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Amen. So there it again is the close, as in the beginning. Verse 12, 2. Put on the eyes of the sermon. Closing, chapter 16, where it's saying to put on those eyes. I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent and what is evil. Verse 19, 16, 19. The Beginning of the doctrine of the practical application, excuse me, practical application, chapter 12, of the practical application of doing the doctrine, the beginning, chapter 12, 1 and 2, your spiritual act of worship, is to put on the eyes of equity and what it means in learning how to walk a sanctified life is closed in 16 the same way that it opens up in 12. You've come full circle. You've got to the beginning by the end. Can you complete the circle? Can, can you come to the knowledge of the truth? Can you walk a sanctified life? That's where the higher position and that's where the overcomer is. Or do you just want to be a partaker and say, hey, I'll leave it all, all up to God? Well, in the end, when you die, if you don't walk a sanctified life, he will fully sanctify you, as he has already fully justified you. It's already done in equity, because equity is always forward-looking. The death on the cross 2,000 years ago, you and I, as believers, were nailed to the cross with him. Equity looks at it being forward and always being done. 
Equity says what ought to be done, equity considers as being done already. And when Christ said it to tell us die, he said it is finished. Equity comes into play and bang, it's done. Right then, it's all been done. In God's eyes, through his eyes of equity, everything in Christ has been completed. The books are now closed, except you don't have the realization and the knowledge and the understanding of that. Because you are going by a different book and you don't know it. You're going by the book of Satan that you've been born into. You've been born into a barn. You smell like you're in the barn. And when somebody comes up to you and says, hey, you stink, you say, what? I don't smell a thing. You've been in the barn too long. Come out of the barn. Come out of the world. You're commanded to come out of the world. All Christians are commanded to come out of the world. If you don't, that's your choice. You will stand before Christ and you will answer to him. And when he asks you, what did you do with what Christian Walters taught you? that I sent him to you to get you to sanctify your life. How come you didn't sanctify your life? Now you go to the bottom of the list. Spend eternity there. And oh, the wailing and gnashing of teeth in heaven. If I would have only listened, I could have been next to the throne for eternity. I could have been Christ with Christ longer, more fellowship time. I could have had many more rewards. Oh, jeez, I missed it. I blew it. That's partaker. What's an overcomer? Oh, he's singing and partying with Christ. He's with every banquet that's being thrown because he's a general. He's got more responsibilities. He's got more authority over many more cities. He's been given gifts. He wears stripes on his arm that the others don't have. Everybody knows this man because he walked a sanctified life. And his credentials are marked by he stands next to Christ. That's an overcomer. One that's willing to sell his wealth of the world. Do away with the commerce and the false idols. The god of Ishtar, Baal, Moloch. Stopping worshipping the golden calf. It's not about money, power, and sex. It's all about the love that you give to one another in Christ. Now in closing, I already talked about Acts 16.30 where the Philippians jailer said, What must I do to be saved? Paul responded and said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But I go to the only place that I know in the scriptures where it says, This is the gospel. I go to Corinthians 15, verse 1, where it says, This is the gospel. Corinthians, verse 15, 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel, which I preach to you. So this is the gospel. And here it comes, verse 3. 1 through uh, 3. Three starts where it is, the meat. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And verse four, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Believe that, because that's all Christ's cross work. And got nothing to do with you. It's not your works. Just believe this, what he did. He did this for the forgiveness of sins. Your sins, my sins. And if you accept that, then I welcome you to God's kingdom if you believe this. And you are now a Christian reconnected back with God the Father through God the Son, Jesus Christ. And all the angels in heaven rejoice over the saving of one soul. And with that, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. So they shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel, and then I will bless them. Romans 12, 1 and 2. That's how you invoke his name. Do the practical application of the doctrine in 1 through 8, spelled out and how to do it in chapters 12 through 16 in Romans. That's how to invoke his name. In putting on the eyes of equity, Psalm 17:2, and understanding what that means, how to lose your life to save it. Losing your life, that's the same thing as what the rich young ruler was told. Sell all that you own and come follow me after you've given it all to the poor. That really determines whether or not how you value the kingdom. Is the kingdom worth everything that you own that you're willing to sell at in a justified sense because you realize the importance of it? And in a sanctification sense, are you willing to lose your life that you know now in all its satanic principles and start out on a new kingdom journey, perhaps going through the wilderness first until you learn how to survive? Can you go out into a desert and get rid of everything that you own now? 
like the rich young ruler, he couldn't see how he could do that. Or are you just going to be a Christian that, I'll continue to worship Satan as being Christian, although you don't think you are, but you're participating in commercial stuff. And you turn out to be just a partaker in heaven. Choice is yours. Choose this day which God you want to serve. And with that, I'd like to close and say we're going to open it up for Q&A. Anybody have any questions? Press star 8. Star 8. Anybody? Questions? Star 8. And yeah, hey, Christian. Hey, who's this? This is Mark. Hi, Mark. How you doing? Praise the Lord. Um, yes. I, I had a couple questions for you. I um, They kind of piggyback off each other here. Um, you know, the stuff you've been teaching here the last couple of uh, last couple of weeks has been pretty intense. Um, I, for me, anyway. Um, I was raised, when I was a child, I was raised a, a Catholic. You know, we went to Catholic church and all that. And, um, you know, as time went on, uh, when I got married, my wife and I, we were both married in the Catholic church and all that. And um, we kind of both decided, uh, you know, not too long after that, that uh, we kind of just didn't really feel like we were really getting the full text of the scriptures because a lot of uh, Catholics are very... Um, they're into a lot of the ritual stuff, you know, like the communion and the baptism and all that stuff. And, um, you know, the, the priests, you know, none of them were supposedly married. So, I mean, it was just really hard to really get the gist of what was being said because everything was just kind of repeated, you know. And um, so we had uh, decided to join another, uh, it was Christian Relay, it was uh, Cal Calvary Chapel, I guess was the name of it. And I guess my point is that every time that we, or that I've, uh, listen to people preaching the gospel or, you know, um, talking about these things. Um, nobody's obviously done it like you have, but it always seems like, you know, I've always believed in Jesus Christ. I've always believed in everything that was taught about him rising from the dead, and, you know, all of that. Um, but it was almost as if it was the people that were preaching the gospel that were, I, I, I don't want to, I guess deceiver might be a too harsh of a word. Maybe they didn't really know or, or whatnot. But I've always noticed that a lot of the preachers uh, would basically preach one thing, but I don't think they were doing what they were preaching, meaning they would always say, you know, oh, you should not ask for more, you should ask for less, kind of a mentality. But yet, you know, they were living pretty, you know, they were living pretty good. I wouldn't say, you know, crazy off the hook, but just, uh, you know, they were doing pretty well for themselves. And and so I, I guess my question is, um, you had mentioned, you're mentioning get out of, get, getting out of commerce, which I can totally see. I mean, yes, it, 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 I, I can, I can honestly say yes, I, I have a hard time with that because I, I am still asking those questions. How would I do this? Yeah, I could, I could probably grow, grow my own food. Um, you know, I don't know what I'd do if I broke my leg or something, but, so I, I'm just curious. Um, you said on a call not too long ago, a few months back, that, you didn't care if the economy crashed or the dollar crashed because you're not participating. Um, you're basically not worried about it because you don't, you know, you don't participate in it. So I, <laughs> I just have to ask. I, I'm just curious because I mean, uh, I I would assume you're probably still somewhat. Um, I mean, you're calling on a telephone line here with you know, uh, you know, some some service provider. So I'm just curious. I mean, if you're not in the system. I mean, I, I just have to ask, how are you, I mean, how are you doing it right now? I mean, is that, is that what you're going to basically teach us to do or, um, yeah, yeah. you know? Uh, you know, I rely on the system somewhat myself because uh, I have to, because we haven't learned everything we need to learn to totally get out. Right. So, but the, but the important thing is, at least I see the way to get out, but most people are stuck in the system not even contemplating or seeing that they have to get out. So they're caught in an iniquity. You know, I'm in an iniquity because I'm forced to be in iniquity because of, of uh, there's no other way. But if we have more and more people contributing, you know, to doing the substance thing and living in the uh, Garden of Eden, back to the Garden of Eden project, that... You know, I don't need to, say, grow vegetables in my backyard because I've got some farmer who is now in the kingdom and he grows vegetables, say, for everybody. That way, that would free me to do what I do the best, what God has given me. But me being a Christian and seeing the responsibility, 
I must grow vegetables myself until that time takes place. And that's the same right. way with everything else in this kingdom. Uh, you mentioned if you broke your leg, you know, you can grow vegetables in your backyard, but that wouldn't fix your broken leg. Right. You would have to have somebody in the kingdom who is a doctor and be able to administer you and what you need fixing your broken leg. But until we have somebody in the kingdom who is a doctor that can do that, either we do it ourselves or we participate in the system. Right. So you're, you're basically saying that, I mean, like I'm very conscious of what you're saying, and, and I'm, I'm probably... To get, you know, get I'm out. To get out is a process, and it isn't going right. to happen overnight. We right. have to get out a little bit at a time and cut our dependency upon Satan's kingdom to finally, in the end, we are totally out. And I don't know of anybody who's totally out. Yeah, <laughs> that's, gonna, that's what I was going to ask you, anybody. There. <laughs> oh man, because it, but see the way I'm the way I'm viewing all this is what you're saying is like yes, 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 but it's like you know, it, it's so, and it's not because I want to be in the system. I mean, the more I, the more I, Wait, I here's what, I'm what you're struggling. Yeah, it's what you're struggling yeah. with. You're struggling with the very scenario of the Israelites coming out of Egypt where they had the plenty of what they thought they needed into a wilderness because that's exactly what I'm going to do with everybody else in this group or everybody else that joins us. I'm like Moses leading you out of what you think you need, what you have already, and I'm going to lead you into a wilderness where you have to produce what you need yourself. Now, it comes down to whether or not you want to do it. That's the same scenario that the rich young ruler was presented with. Sell all that you own, give it to the poor so you'll have treasures in heaven, and then come follow me. But you see, the Israelites had a lack of faith. They were surrounded on a cul-de-sac by an army of Egyptians ready to pounce on them, and they blamed Moses and said, Moses, you brought us out here to, to die. We're surrounded and we can't get out. And Moses went to pieces and said, oh, my dear Lord, God, you know, help me. And God says, what are you coming to me for? <coughs> you got the big stick. Hold it out over the water. <coughs> so he did. And the waters parted. And they all walked across dry shot. And where did he lead them to? Out into a desert. Where they had no food, no water. At least they thought. Walking by sight, they saw no food, no water because they weren't relying on God's strength. The creator of the heavens and the earth, the creators of everything, and they thought they were not going to be taken care of. God brought them out into a desert just to test their faith, to see where their faith was. But what did he do? He brought water from a rock. He bought, brought manna from heaven. He fed them and clothed them. Their clothes didn't wear out for the 40 years they walked in the desert, neither did their sandals. But this is a test. <coughs> it's really a test. It's a test of walking by faith or walking by sight. What looks like a desert to God is a river of water and bread from heaven. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. But the covenant says, you must do the walk, and by you doing the walk, I will be with you. <clears throat> if you don't walk, I won't be there. But you got to do the walk. you got to cross over the River Jordan. Are you... Um, uh are, in, in, in what you're talking about here in, in, in the sessions, are you going to actually, you know, are, are we going to have some sort of a gauge for everybody, kind of like where everybody might be at? Are you going to do something like that, or is it just kind of a, you know, everybody's got to kind of do their own thing? I mean, it's going to be, you know, you talked about the job, okay? Uh, <laughs> getting rid of the job, that's Joe. Uh, getting rid of the job, is Joe. Yep. You know, that's, that's probably, that's probably, the, you know, that's probably the biggest thing that, that uh, I would probably say, at least at this point, that uh, would probably be the most difficult for people just because of, you know, the way we've been conditioned. But um, And then, you know, thinking about how all those other things that we, that we use that we're accustomed to, how those things are going to manifest for us. So you're, you're basically saying, you know, have faith and whatnot. But um, so I'm, yeah, I'm just curious. We, as we as, need you know, water. The rock will appear to strike. <laughs> If there's anything needed in the kingdom, God will provide it. I mean, I could tell you some stories that have happened to me personally. I know that that's you know what God does. He shows up at 11:59, just when you're about ready to think you're going to perish and the rug's going to be pulled out from under you. All of a sudden, there's that manifestation of that invisible step. It's just like stepping out on a Grand Canyon 
onto a platform that you can't see. But looking at it, looks like you're going to fall to your destruction. But God always shows up with the platform. You just like go from one of his hands to the next of his hands. Just like breadcrumbs spread seen in my life too many times. And if it is his will, it will happen. But if we are held back due to lack of faith, well, that's really fear, and that's the devil. And it's really the devil fear that's holding everybody back because they don't really believe that God is going to supply what they need in the desert. They see the desert. That's the same thing that they saw when they went to cross into the promised land. Most of them didn't see the large fruit that God was going to give them on the vines. No, they saw the large giants. They says, we can't take the land. There's too many giants in there. It was only Caleb and uh, uh, Joshua that said, hey, let's go. The fruit over there is gigantic. Two views. They were both walking by sight, but what is it that you see? Elijah out in the desert, plains of Jezreel, surrounded by uh, 160 some thousand soldiers that were going to kill him the next morning. And he asked the servant, "Well, you know, what do you see?" And he says, "Man, I see we're going to die. We got 160 thousand troops out there going to slaughter us." And Elijah say, "You mean to tell me you don't see the angels of the Lord standing about?" And the next morning, one angel killed 167 thousand of them, whatever the number was. They were all dead. You know, I read in Romans chapter 15 where it says that the instructions, the Old Testament is for our instructions. For example, those are like parallel models. But can we apply those parallel models and apply them to present day? I think God is just waiting. Waiting for a Moses to come along to lead the people. Lead them across the River Jordan into a promised land. The first place I'm going to take them is through a wilderness. Do you see that happen? Do I think it happened? I know it happened. No, no, no. I mean, do you think that we will get another Moses in our lifetime? In other words, you know... Uh, the location know. of Moses? Yeah, I imagine we will, yeah. Uh, he will be like seems... John the Baptist. He will be one out there crying in the wilderness. That's why I keep saying repent for the kingdom and its, uh, God's kingdom and its enforcement is near. That's really John the Baptist. You know, he was the forerunner of Christ coming back. I mean, this Moses is the forerunner like John is. Because I almost think, as I had mentioned, I think before that, it, I just, I almost think that when it happens, I think it's, we're all going to be forced to, you know what I'm saying? I don't, you know, there'll be some of us that are, you know, gradually trying to get out, and, you know, doing, you know, you know being, being faulty, you know, being, uh, uh, you know, we're all faulty, but, you know, we, we've got to have our faith and we've got to walk by, you know, not by sight, but, um, but I do think at some point, I think it's going to be, you know, I think God's just going to say, okay, you know what, I think it's time, there's, not enough of these guys are <laughs> are doing it, so, you know, and I think he's just basically, I think it's going to, you know, force everybody to do it. I think, I don't know, is that what you see, or? I think the time that? is now. Yeah. And if it comes about, then I know that time is now. But i got to try. I have to be found doing the, the job. Yeah. Yeah, because everybody leaves kind of the job, and I'm going to go in the promised land to the job. Yeah, because a lot of people are already losing their jobs. <laughs> I think he's already making them deal. Good. And that made so want to everybody so. need to make the switch into a job instead of the job. Yeah. Kind of a sign. It may be God forcing them out. That's why I look at all these foreclosures and everything happening. The, the economy going to snap. And if it does snap, great. That's going to be wonderful. <laughs> Bring it on, Lord. I want to see it happen. Because that's really a signpost telling you to get out. Now, can you read the sign? Do you, do you think a lot of people are going to die in that, in that scenario? No, I don't believe so. Uh, I, yeah, I do. A lot of people are going to die. But the Christians? No, I don't believe the Christians are going to die. Because I think Christ has been given. He has paid the price that God demands. And he is going to protect the church from his judgment. I mean, like, people not getting that the sign is to get out. You know, get out. You know, Well, that's going to be the spiritual dryness of uh, not walking a sanctified life in chapter 6 and 7 in Romans. People jumping out the windows. Yeah, like they did back in the 30s when the Depression, yeah. But, you know, that's where you think you got your substance, where you're building, putting your treasures. You put it in the worldly stuff or you put it in God's uh, kingdom. You know, I still want to do that, Christian. Like I said, I just, I, I felt over the years I've just been misled to some extent. And I mean, I can't totally, you know, blame other people. I mean, you do have to take some responsibility. But, you know, I kind of listen to what you're saying and I'm like, God, I hope this is the one, I hope this is this guy's got it, got it down. I mean, you are saying, you are, you are saying stuff that I've never heard. I've heard variations of it, but not, not getting out of commerce. It was always, 
you know, you know, it was there, there, money was never really sold it was evil, but it was kind of like, you know, that shouldn't be the focus, really, and yeah. you know, give back. And, you know, it's like an, um, the Amish, really, uh, in a way. Because the Amish have their own little world, their own little kingdom that they participate in, but trouble is they're like in the backwoods. I don't think Christ's community is supposed to be in the backwoods. They're supposed to be the front runners. They should have all the high technology. They should have all the cell phones, the computers. They should be running the show. Yeah. They all should be driving Rolls Royces if they want to. But me, I make Rolls Royces. You want one? Let me give you one. But here's what I need. I need metal to make one. Somebody's got to supply me with my needs. But that's really the... Uh, the whole scenario how God set up the kingdom as the Israelites walked in the deserts because he automatically divided up them into 12 tribes. And they, he set apart one tribe, the Levites, to be the priests. And all the other 11 were supposed to give to the Levites, the 12th one, and support them in their work. And their sole work was to do the temple worship. But today, Christians are all priests. So we should all be giving to one another, supporting one another's needs in whatever God has given you in skills. And if we, he brings the whole kingdom together, if all kingdom uh, Christians come together with all the different variations of skills that everyone has, you will be able to uh, take care of all your needs because Christian so-and-so will be supplying you with whatever you need, uh, this guy over here will supply that. That guy over there will supply this. You know, everybody will be supplying what their gift is in God, producing, and everybody's needs will be supplied. But God's got to bring that kingdom together, and I believe He is. And you know what's you know what's funny about you saying that? And I was going to bring this up on the last call. You know, a lot of people would say what you're describing is, oh, that's socialism. That's, yeah, that's right. Kind of, that's well, I got news. Here. It's not called socialism. It's called a monotheistic society with God being the head. It's a dictatorship. It's a dictatorship. God's got a dictatorship, but it's a righteous dictatorship. In other words, he demands an obedience. He dictates an obedience. You got a choice whether you want to do it or not. In other words, he sets down a train track that you, the train, must run on. That's a dictatorship or that's a restriction. Laws are the train track rails. And the law is equity. With fair, just, and right, you get a God that administers that train track with fair, just, and right. You've got a righteous God. And why would you not want to serve a righteous God? And that's when the train runs the freest, when it's on the track, not when it's crashing down somebody's house through their yard because it's off the train track. But you see, all our trains are off the track today because we're not going on how God says to worship him. He says the train must be on the train track. That's not socialism. That's dictatorship. It's a mono, single. Mono means one. Monotheistic society with God's people running the show as God says it should be run. Equity. Equity eyes. Fair, just, and right. That's the key. Righteousness. Good stuff. Well, how would somebody else have? I'm sure there's other people that want to ask questions, so. Okay, Mark. Thanks for coming Thanks, on. Man. Appreciate it. You bet. No problem. Okay, who's next? Anybody got a question? R8? Nobody? We got a clear board. Anybody? Question? Question? Anybody? Last call. Come on. Okay, the next caller. Somebody got their hand up? You're unmuted. Go ahead, caller. You're unmuted. Hello? Anybody? Star 8, anybody got a call, a question? Oh, hello, hello? Hello, who's this? Oh, this is John out of North Carolina. How you doing, Christian? This is my first time on the call. How you doing, John? Um, Great. I, I was being nosy the other night discovered discovered you on talk show. I'm so grateful that I did because uh, I've never heard it. I've, al I've always heard that the Bible was the first law book. Let me basically clarify that. Um, some good stuff. I, I really like it. And, um... Well, we have is, 11 other huh? shows, 11 other recordings to check out. Yeah, I did. That's, that's what I did. I was actually on there the other day, and uh, I was on there before you started, a day before, and I heard a call when, um, like, maybe two weeks ago, and then when I came back, you had already started doing um, this episode here. And I listened to about six or seven of them the other day. 
and uh, I like the way that you um, break that Romans down. I really do. But my question, my question is, is that um, I was listening to one of the previous audios and he was telling a guy about understanding um, trust that he needed to listen to the first 30 episodes. Are those still available? Yeah, they're from the old NTT, uh, which was like the uh, living the life in Egypt. Uh-huh. It's really about how to merge and extinguish the debt according to New Trust Technology, which is NTT. And there is uh-huh. the top 40 audios in that. But we've really come out of we've come out of Egypt. Well, we've taken on a okay because we've come from Egypt, which was Satan's kingdom, and we've made the transformation into you know the promised land, the journey towards the promised land, the Garden of Eden project. And so it's a okay. new journey. It's a, n- a new NTT. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Okay. So I really don't recommend the old NTT. <coughs> okay. Okay. So you, you're doing something different now. Yeah, it's a new phase. It's a new beginning. Okay. Stepping out in, uh, 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 over the river. We were going in the same direction, but we've crossed over the River Jordan. Okay. Okay. So, so basically, you will be going back over the same thing or... Yeah, this is a twelfth, will be new information. This new journey. Uh, this is the twelfth episode. New journey. Okay. So there's eleven. Okay. So there's <clears throat> eleven other recordings, and they should be listed on the talk show. Uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I downloaded them. I think I got. Um, you know, I'm a truck driver, so I'll be listening as I'm riding. You know. Well, you know, and, um, you can still get those other ones. They're they're still available. They're out there. Oh yeah. How, how would I access? Them? Uh, do a search for NTT Christian Walters, and they'll pop up all over. Okay, okay. There's seven. I, I tried that. But I tried that on Talk to You, but it it only came up the one, the newer ones you're doing now. Uh, that's because it was a private <laughs> group. It was the Neomorpheus call, in which we switched to the NTT call, and it was not available uh, publicly. Oh, okay. You have to know okay. the pin number to get in. You have to be invited. Oh, okay. But we'd no longer participate in that one. Uh, it's no longer being well, reported. Just, it's no longer being. It's no longer. Uh, uh, it's not. It's uh, not being enhanced. It's just. It's done. I've gone from that. It is still. Okay. Exists. There are well, 700 recordings of it available, and particularly the top 40 of those. They are out there. They're available. If you want to search them, you'll find them. We used to distribute them and be active in that. We are no longer distributing them. We are no longer active in it. But that doesn't mean they're not available. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. I'm going to definitely stay tuned and uh, yeah. um, well, we found out do this every... Instead of trying to solve a merger and extinguish of the debt in the Egypt or Satan's kingdom, that we would just bypass the kingdom of Satan altogether, and we would do that by crossing over and getting out of that. Okay. What everybody really needed is a kingdom change. That was the solution to the, everybody's problem, a kingdom change, and that's what we're doing now. Okay. Makes sense. I mean, anything that doesn't change is dead, so yeah. I can definitely comprehend that. And I appreciate you. And I'll definitely be tuning in, and uh, you do this every Wednesday at the same time? Every Wednesday, same time, yeah. Or you can get the recording. Okay, okay. Well, hey, I appreciate you, Christian, and you have a blessed evening. Well, let's hope the Lord blesses me with another 700 recordings on this one. I heard that. <laughs> I heard that. It, it'll happen. All right. All right. You have a nice night. All right. Thanks for coming on. I forgot your name again. John. John. North Carolina. Okay, John. John, North Carolina. Appreciate you for coming on. Thanks. Yes, sir. You too. Who's next? Anybody? Star 8 question, anyone? Star 8, anybody? Question? Star 8, anybody? Hello. Hello, Christian. Hey, is this Chris? Yes, yeah, Christian Merlin. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Thanking God for his great grace. Enjoying the show. Um, I just had a question, you know, you were talking about, like, the ritual, I guess, of, of being baptized in communion. But, um, you know, if there was somebody who was new to Christ and, you know, they were discovering and, and reading and renewing their mind, and they wanted to be baptized because our Lord and Savior was baptized, even though it's a ritual, I mean, they could, they could still yep. have a... Here's what the problem is. He was baptized, so you don't have to be. He did the work for you. You don't have to uh-huh. be baptized. He was baptized right. for me. He does everything never, for me in justification. Yeah, I never thought of it that way. And I'm not, and I, I wasn't saying that, yeah, you have to be baptized to be saved. Well, there are some churches that say that. Right, true, true. So he, he did it all out the sign of circumcision, circumcision of the penis, you know, no, it's the inward circumcision of the heart. 
That's the real substance. What's the meaning? That's what Nicodemus was coming and asking Jesus. He really wanted to know, uh, are you the one Messiah? You know, he, I wanted to, he wanted to know. And first thing, before he opened his mouth, Jesus hit him with the, you must be uh, born again. Born again, right. <laughs> what an irony. <laughs> Dang, he gets hit with that, and he said, "What do you? Th- uh-huh. How can a mother re-enter his mother's womb? Uh, how can a guy re-enter uh, his mother's womb? <laughs> oh, come on, Jesus, you're with the program here. <laughs> you're of the spiritual Sanhedrin, telling people what to do, and you don't understand spiritual things. It's it's not circumcision of the penis, he says. It's circumcision of the heart. It's not physical baptism by water. How much water is enough? No, it's baptism by the Holy Spirit. You know how do you get it in the heart?" Yeah, by believing what Christ did. He sends his Holy Spirit as the uh, sign that you are sealed by him. So it's not the outward physical acts or works of men done for justification. Oh, it comes back down to pistos, faith, or belief, or trust. Trust in what? Because faith or belief or trust has to have an object. And the object of faith, belief, and trust is Christ. Christ's cross work. He shed his blood, and there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. He shed his blood. So it was his death that imputed righteousness to you. Right. Not all his suffering, it was his death. And the Catholics want to focus in on the passion of Christ, the suffering. No, that's the wrong doctrine to focus in on for justification. So, did you ask a question, or did I answer a question? I don't know. What else is on your mind? No, I think you answered. I mean, and it's just talking about, you know, always had to be bloodshed in the Old Testament. The priests, and they brought animals, and their work was never done. They were always standing, and they had a chair in the temple. Yeah, but they but, didn't look at the substance behind what they were doing, which was the true meaning. They just took it as a ritual and turned it into a tradition. Right. But it was like the Passover. Uh, they celebrate the Passover, the Jews do, the Yom Kippur. But Christ is the Passover, because coming out of Egypt, they spread the door on the lentil post, the doorpost. And unless the blood was spread on the doorpost, the death angel didn't pass you by. Right. So that was a foreshadow of Christ coming and shedding his blood. So how do we celebrate Passover today as Christians? We don't have to. Christ already did that work. Right. So what do we do to worship God? live sanctified lives, apply equity in the sense of justification, in other words, come to faith, apply equity in the sanctification sense, in other words, pull out the ashra poles and the false altars out of your life, sanctify your life, change your lifestyle kingdom from Satan to God's, because we all, I don't care whether you realize it or not, we are all 100% satanic, living satanic lives. Even Christians, even though they're justified, because they're participating in a system that they were born into, that they had no say-so into what they entered into, and you were put into a satanic system, and now you don't know because you think everybody else is doing the same thing, and you think it's okay. But it's the discernment what you need. You need the eyes of equity to say, hey, what we're doing here is wrong. It's not righteous. It doesn't right. comport to what the scriptures say. Something's wrong. Well, I'll tell you what's wrong. We're still stuck in Egypt as Christians. Stuck on start. Worshipping false gods. Blocking the blessings of God from re- us receiving them. Because we haven't pulled out the Asher poles. We haven't done a Nehemiah book change. We're still worshipping the devil. And we don't know it. But that doesn't excuse you. You're still walking under the Deuteronomy curse, whether you know it or not. You have a mind to you can't understand the eyes of equity. So how do you change? First thing you got to do is you got to realize something ain't right. In other words, you got to start to agree with God. And when you're humble because you're agreeing with God, you know there's something wrong. Then you got to pray and you got to ask for him to remove the confusion from your mind. That's Matthew. What is it? Chapter 5? Talking about prayer? You do not receive right. because you do not ask. If you don't ask, you ain't going to get it. Well... If you're not asking, it's because you probably don't understand is that you need something. 
So the first thing is to realize that I need something, and if something is wrong, and when I finally figured out, yeah, there is something wrong, now I'm in agreement with God, you know, okay, now I can't change myself, I can't resurrect myself, I can't move from point A to point B, because that's going to take a miracle change. It's going to take a change of heart, and he has to pull out your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. You can't do it, but you've got to ask him. If you ask him, he'll do it. And then when you ask, you have to ask for the right motive, because what you ask for, you're going to use for yourself. No, God wants you to give it to somebody else. And if you ask to give to somebody else with that, then he'll grant it to you. It's like Solomon. He didn't ask him for money. God wouldn't give him money. But how did he get the money? In fact, Solomon's been the richest man there's ever been. Solomon had more gold and silver than any man alive today. How did he get it? He asked for wisdom. He asked for equity eyes, basically. He said, give me wisdom and knowledge to lead your people, Lord. In other words, he said, give me equity eyes. And God said, since you didn't ask me for money, since you asked me for equity eyes, since you asked me for wisdom and knowledge to lead my people, I will make you the wisest man there ever will be. And along with that, I will make you the richest. I'll give you all the gold and silver. But what do we do? We ask for the gold and silver. No, I don't need the gold and silver. Give me the wisdom. But you got to ask first. you got to ask with the right heart, the right motive. Because I want to lead the people. Because I want to give it to everybody else. And you'll get it that way. He'll give it to you. Now, you might not get it overnight. You may have to pray for ten years. But with perseverance, sooner or later. How long did Jabez ask pray? <laughs> keep seeking, asking, and knocking. Keep asking, yeah. But do it in righteousness. And what would righteousness be? Uh, so I could love my brother as myself. Lord... Bless me so I can bless others. Basically, that's what it is. That's the prayer, right? Yep. But then you better be given what you get blessed with. Because Philippians 5, 13 and forward explains how the account that you have with God, how it is filled. It basically says in there, it says, it's based on your giving. It, you give to receive. And it comes back to you multiplied. So you give a denomination of one, and you get maybe ten back. Mm-hmm. And how long is it going to take to fill up the account and that kind of return proportion? That's a tenfold equivalent. That's 10,000%. Wow. Wow. As you will get, you, a man reaps what he sows. And what he reaps is based on a 30, 60, 100-fold return. It could be a one-to-one -one based on your giving, or it could be a 100-fold. A 100-fold is 10,000%. 10,000%. You take one righteous man, or say... Three, or how about 12? And if they all gave like that overnight, there'd be enough for everybody. Oh, anything? Total opposite, total opposite in the commerce world we live in. No, commerce world is taking. It's like a right. millstone around your neck. It takes from you, it takes your life from you. It converts right. all your life, your time, into money, which is worthless and controlled by somebody else. It's a dead end deal. Yeah, that's the definition of. Robbing, killing, and destroying. That's Satan. You're being robbed of your life. There's no freedom in that. A free economy? That's a misnomer. It's like saying the sky is purple. Just because I say the sky is purple doesn't mean so. Oh, yeah, they'll promote the free market economy, though. Yeah. How can it be free when I don't determine what the denomination of a dollar is, is and I don't determine how much I get to make per hour? I'm told these things. But that's for the immature, spiritually. Until everybody's ready to come out of that, they're still in it. As long as you're spiritually immature, you will continue on being fed by the nipple of Satan. Mm. Because the responsibility of coming out is you, you've got to be doing it yourself. You've got to be doing something. Instead of participating in the kingdom with your time, you need to be com uh, committing your time to the kingdom of God. And that's when everything stops from flowing out of you into that satanic kingdom to where that satanic kingdom stuff starts coming, flowing back in. You just switched it from out to in. You put off by putting on. You stop the outflow, putting off, by putting on the inflow. Put on the inflow. Do the kingdom walk. They're using you as a battery. No, use them as a battery. Human resources, as you said before. The wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. Amen. Throw the switch the other way. They're draining you. The world is draining you. Amen. 
Anything else? No, I, I'm good, and I'm enjoying it, and uh, looking forward to hearing, you know, as we continue this. May the Lord continue to bless you and your wife. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for coming on. All right. Anybody else? Question? Hello? Yes. Who's this? Uh, Al Rain. I'm New York. How are you doing? All right. I've just been kind of a, uh, a cheery day thinking about what happens if we don't give you know, and what we could lose, and, you know, that the truth is something that uh, is really at risk here, which, you know, I equate to righteousness uh, at this stage of the... Yeah, you can't lose your salvation, but you can lose your blessings. Well, I'm just saying, at this stage, in, in terms of all the earth, you know, it seems that people uh, will, that if we lose the truth, as it uh the whole thing can collapse. It's really, that, that was something I was contemplating for many years. Anyway, uh... Well, the I world is going to collapse. The thing is, just don't be found in it. Well, I don't mean that. I meant the universe to collapse. But universe? I don't think it's... Uh, physical don't creation think, is not going to collapse. Right, but I mean, it all stems... It's, it's the truth, you know. It's coming out of the lies. It's very, very important, and probably why we all came born and are on earth at this time if you read through the Bible say. But we have uh, I was just that's not why I came out. I came on because uh there's many places it says still, still, you know. And um at one time I was looking at this if we're made in the image of how could one not really believe? You know, it seems like that's the disconnect. If we're made in the image of how could one not really believe? Because God has to call you, because all humanity has fallen due to Adam, and all have come out of Adam. We all have the same yes. problem. We have an imparted, uh, imputed righteous, uh, uh, imputed sin. Excuse me. Right, but this was an inner question when I was still, and um, the words came to me: "It's a mirror that we don't see, you know." And then I was reading Job, yeah, it's like, all in like, like a phone, coming yeah. together, where Job says. I heard, but now I do. Right. I defy myself. So sometimes when people read that, like the first time I read that, I read it as despise myself mean, uh, you know, it seems very little and like, well, man, you were little before, now you're even littler. But really when I looked closely at it, this word despise, it, you stop spying uh, on something that you think you see but you don't see because because you have haven't seen. Okay? So a mirror that we do not see. So he says, I heard but now I see you. Yeah, but how did he see him? He finally so, saw him after going through so much his eye. wasn't with his uh, eyes. Well it was with another eye inside, you know. The eyes of equity. It was by okay. the spirit that he saw. Right. Right. By spiritual eye. Uh, right. Spiritual eye. But, but there's that word, we say I all the time, but wouldn't it be great if we say, I'm not going to use I unless I'm... Well, that's I in a different use. context, different spelling also. Well, it's a different spelling, but it sounds the same. So if we were yeah, sounding sounds more... Cool by prepositions that convey meaning. And prepositions would be the correct use of the word I letter I, or the letter E-Y-E. -E. Your preposition, yeah, if you're in the spirit or in the physical. Yeah, if you actually, yeah. if you know and understand equity, have put on the eyes of equity by understanding, you have seen the face of God. Yes, so anyway, I was really just trying to get across that this word despise can sometimes throw people, and sometimes it's good to start looking up words we think we know the meaning of, or just observe the commas when you're reading scripture too. Yeah, so where did and you get the word I? How did, where did you go to get the meaning? I looked up the word despise, and then myself. So From what source? I, what I read it as, then... Well, where did you get your definition source? from? Where did I get the what? Where did you get your definition from? Oh, it was a while ago when I did that, but there's the words 
spy is used a lot, and we know we have, uh, every government has a lot of spy agencies, and, you know, a lot of people feel very monitored, like we're spied on all the time. So this gets more intense, so I'm looking at the statement in terms of how it wasn't, uh, I'm trying to get across something here that he said, I despise myself. In other words, by seeing you, I'm not yeah, but I'm I'm trying I'm trying to come where, where did the meaning come from? Because unless you're taking it from the Hebrew or the Chaldee dictionary of meanings, then which is a context written according to historical content of the meaning of the word at the time, you can be thrown off by a more modern meaning. Okay. So what is your interpretation of the word despise? You need to go to a Chaldee Hebrew text, context, historically at the time that that was written, and pull out the definition according to that time. What did that word mean according to that time? Okay, I can do that, but I have also looked at how it's been moved forward, too, and looked yeah. at even in, even in Black's Law Dictionary, can't even in, in Merriam-Webster's. You can't but, read in a definition of modern time to an Old Testament word. You're going to no, I'm not feeding it in. What I'm what I'm trying to 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 get across is that yeah, but I'll, it's very easy caught up in a modern sense of chasing. Well, things. in the extent that where we live now today, this is our reality that there is a lot of spying going on. So I wanted to get across the the beauty of what Job is saying here because it's a very turnaround statement which is now that I see you, I am not so hung up and feeling like I'm spot, being spied on or even spying on myself because ultimately, even if you think you're being watched or you're, this or that, it's still a thought coming from your mind that you are. Yeah, but I don't care what men see. I see what I want to uh, focus in on what God sees. That's exactly what it, Job is saying here. That's yeah. what I'm saying. All I'm trying to get across the eyes of equity. is that be, I need to before be that eyes of equity. Saying, yeah. I, I want to see like God sees, not how man sees. Yeah, so I, I don't think Job is really saying, I hate myself. He's just saying, oh, I, my eyes change, and I'm seeing how you see. <laughs> That's all I'm glad to say. Yeah, well, that's the putting on the eyes of equity, yeah. Psalm 17, too. So there's the choice. You can either look through and ultimately go down and become part of the CIA or, uh, you know, go to God. <laughs> anyway, that's my... Well, humor. the CIA is part of the world, so, you know, why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, it comes back, back, back to, you know, uh, changing the heart, which is putting on uh, equity eyes. Transformation in Romans 12, too. The correct way of working. The spiritual act of worship. What is the spiritual act of worship? Seeing God with spiritual eyes. And that's the eyes of equity. Yeah, it was a real change of heart for, for Job. Instantly seen. <laughs> so, anything else? No, that's all. Thank you. Okay, thanks for coming on. Anybody else? And who's next? Nobody? All right, I think we're going to call it quits for tonight then. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming, and we'll see you all next week. And same time, same channel, same topic. We'll be talking about uh, probably, who knows, I haven't decided yet. Since that completes Romans, we may go into Matthew next. Or we may talk about the kingdom of God, really. Anyway, we'll get there next week. Everyone be blessed. Appreciate it. Praise the Lord. Night all.